Hey guys, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about um, a topic that is, at least for temporarily, called Cosmos Proof of Stake. We're still trying to name down the exact terminology. Uh, bonded Proof of Stake, okay. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about is basically, you know, I'll be talking, when a lot of people talk about Proof of Stake, uh, you know, they're usually actually really talking a lot about like consensus and how we think of blockchains is that it's really this like interaction between some sort of consensus protocol and a state machine. And so, you know, when people are talking about proof of stake, they're usually talking about like, you know, Kendermint versus Casper versus uh, Honey Badger. Usually they're really talking about consensus protocols. Um, and, you know, these are great. But well, and you, you know you can put all sorts of different comments, but really these are kind of like separate from proof of stake. Uh, proof of stake is just this like method for how do you select who are the participants in consensus. So you can do like all sorts of different combinations. You know you could do honey badger with like proof of authority. You could do like Casper with like um, some sort of sortition proof of stake. Um, but the one that we're going to be talking about that we're going to be really focusing on is this specific instantiation between Tenderman Core and Cosmos Proof of Stake. So, you know, given that this is the ESC, it's like an academic conference, I'm gonna kind of assume that people are relatively familiar with Tenderman Consensus. Um, for those who aren't, just a brief like 30 second pit, like overview. It's basically a BFT consensus protocol, uh, has one block finality, so that means every block is finalized and, and we don't build the next block until the previous block is finalized. Um, it requires two-thirds of the validator set or validator set by stake to uh, sign on a block in order to commit it. Um, it changes the proposer every round. And one of the drawbacks of Tendermint and really all uh, BFT, classical BFT protocols, is it doesn't scale that well after um, the number of validators reaches beyond a certain point. So, you know, on our live Tendermint test nets, we've had like, you know, over 100 validators, but like, you know, once you get into like the over 500 range, it really starts to like hit a bottleneck because of N squared communication. But great, Tendermint's cool and all, you know, we could do a whole talk on Tendermint, but that's really not what we're talking about today. Today we're gonna be talking specifically about proof of stake or our instantiation of proof of stake. So there's all sorts of like proof of stake methods out there, you know, you may have heard of uh, EOS's DPoS. You know, I don't know if that's really proof of stake or not, but uh, you may have heard of like, you know, Tesos has their liquid proof of stake. So what we have is Cosmos proof of stake or bonded proof of stake. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, very right off the bat, like you know, why proof of stake? You know, I probably don't have to explain it to everyone here. If you're listening to a talk on proof of stake, you probably know. But like you know, this is a Twitter poll I did about a year ago. You know. Environmental reasons, scalability reasons, um, decentralization, like, you know, will stake be more decentralized than hash power? That's actually, I don't know, to be left to be seen. Um, yeah, a couple of reasons. Okay, let's dive in. What, let's just jump right into the basics of proof of stake. Um, what is proof of stake? How does it work? So we have what we call validator operators, right? So people who have stake and they, or stakers, right? They want to participate in the consensus process, right? So what they'll do is they'll go ahead and take their coins and deposit it into a bond. And what this bond does is it gives them voting power based on what percentage of the stake they put. So for example, you know, that middle guy put in 50% of the total bonded coins. He now has 50% of the voting power and the consensus, the, the state machine will let the consensus engine know, by the way, here are the three validators in this consensus set, and this is the, each of their uh, powers. And then Tenderman consensus will handle all of the rest. Okay, great. And you know, but, and what we want is the ability for like do, how proof of stake works is that we want to like make sure people can get slashed. If like, you know, there's the common nothing at stake problem. What prevents someone from like, you know, just doing something malicious, right? Like. Ca causing forks, if there's like, you know, in proof of work, you have your hash power, like you can, you know, if you're working on two different forks, you're kind of splitting your hash power across both of them. But in proof of stake, you know, you create, you create a fork, there's two, blo there's two blocks, but you have the same amount of coins in both forks, so you might as well just keep building on both. So how do we do this? Tenderman Core basically has 
uh, the ability to detect this kind of thing. So if you remember what we put, what I showed you here was one of the things that the consensus engine does is it tells it, while the state machine tells the consensus engine about the validator set, the consensus engine can tell the state machine that, by the way, for this block, here are the validators who signed the block. And then, by the way, also here's any uh, consensus fraud evidence I've picked up in the past, like, two weeks or three, or however long the configuration is set. So this, so Tenement will basically detect, you know, which validators have double signed, which validators have, um, you know, signed when they're not supposed to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the nice thing is what happens is when consents, the Tenement uh, sends the proof of stake module this information, the, we call this process slashing because what happens is consensus evidence comes in we slash that person's bond saying, oh, you did something provably malicious. We're going to take away your stake, and now you don't have any more voting power, and you lost your coins. And, you know, adjust everyone else's uh, voting power uh, uh, equivalently. Um, but now here's the problem. What happens if I do something malicious, and the, immediately the first thing I do is I do something malicious, and then I take my coins and run away. I unbond and move my coins somewhere else. And now, you know, the protocol has no way of slashing me because my coins aren't in the bond anymore, right? It can, the protocol can only slash what's in the bond. I can't go into uh, certain accounts and, like, slash them, especially if the coins have moved around. Um, and so, and there's this, like, there can often be this, like, delay between someone committing a Byzantine fault and the evidence being found and submitted to the chain. So this is why we have this concept called unbonding periods. So what happens is, you know, you're trying to unbond your coins, take them out, but wait, they're put in this like frozen unbonding period and they're kind of like stuck here for three weeks. Uh, in our case, three weeks, you know, different protocols try different variations. I know Casper people are thinking more on the scale of months. Um, and so, you know, what happens here is while you're in the unbonding period, if any evidence is shown that, oh, look, you did some Byzantine behavior during that, uh, in the past while you were a validator, and you're in this unbonding period, this basically gives some time for the Byzantine behavior to be shown. And if it comes in, you know, you're going to get slashed and, you know, your coins will go away. Um, on the other hand, if you, you know you're unbonding and you are putting this unbonding period and, you know, everything's good, no evidence comes out, you can get your coins back after three weeks and you're, you're happy. You're, you can go off with your coins. Um, another interesting thing that also happens with, like, you know, part of the reason of the unbonding period is this idea of it gives time for evidence to be found. Um, and the reason it's so long, like three weeks, is the other uh, effect of this, like, unbonding period is it sets the lower bound for how often nodes have to sync to the blockchain. So one of the security models of proof of stake involves you actually have to sync into the blockchain as at least as often as the unbonding period. So if the unbonding period is three weeks, I have to sync my node at least once every three weeks in order to not be tricked, exact, sort of, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a bit of like, you might be wondering like, oh wait, you know, Yes, I know it takes time for evidence to show up, but like really three weeks, that's a bit high. So, so that's the reason why it's so high. Okay, so, but here's the problem now, right? You know, running a validator is tricky business. It's like, so I was actually giving a panel yesterday on like the process of running validators. And so it's like, you know, you, running a validator basically requires running a hyper secure hotkey that's always live. That's kind of pretty scary, because like, you know, most people just don't have the ability to like run this kind of hyper secure setups. And what they want to do is, but you know, I might have coins and I want to participate in the staking process either to, you know, help secure the network or for the monetary incentives or whatnot. But I don't want to run a validator myself. So, you know, what you can do is we call these people delegators. And what they could do is out of protocol, they could just go ahead and send some coins to the validators, any validator that they like. And then those validators can basically bond it on behalf of uh, those delegators. And, you know, as they get rewards, they can, like, you know, do a kickback to the delegators. So, and, you know, the problem with this is, like, you know, it is sort of trusted. You know, how do you know the validator operator doesn't just, like, run away with your money, right? Or, or actually give you the rewards that they were supposed to. Um, and so, you know, instead of the validator operator being a, like, person, you can have the operator be, like, 
you know, the sm a sm use a smart contract to make sure they don't like do any of those things, run away with your funds or whatnot. And so, right here, snapshot snapshotted is sort of the current state of where the Casper uh, project is right now. So they they basically say that you know we can have this system where you put uh, coins into bonds and then you know, delegators will delegate out of band to these smart contracts, and this is how delegation will work. We're gonna make a little bit of a claim where we actually don't think this is a great idea. We think that delegation should be done in protocol. So we think that the core proof of stake protocol, so whether it's the Casper smart contract or whether it's like the Cosmos staking module, they should know about delegation as a first class piece of the protocol. And I will go in to justify why this is. Uh, primarily for a couple of main features that it gives you that helps decentralization massively. So the first one is, what do we mean by decentralization in protocol, delegation in protocol? Um, so we put delegators and validator operators sort of on the same scale, on the same playing field. And you know, a validator operator will obviously just delegate to their own validator. Like the, so now we kind of change the terminology from bond to validator, but you know, you can think of the same thing. A validator is the bond. Um, and so you know, we'll go ahead and everyone will delegate, including the validator operators, to their own validator, uh, to whoever they want, and the voting powers will be decided. And you know, if someone gets slashed, then everyone who, and so you know, the protocol will keep track of like, oh, what percentage of my coins came from which of my delegators? Um, and if someone gets slashed, then you know, everyone, will, everyone who delegated to that validator will get slashed uh, proportionally. Um, and so, and this is kind of good because it, it helps like make sure uh, the delegators have the same sort of skin in the game as the validators. And you know the benefit to the validators is usually they'll often charge like some sort of commission rate. They'll say like, okay, on all the rewards and fees, I'll take a one percent cut or something. So that's kind of like explaining a little bit of the incentives here. Um, and you know just a little bit about you know how do delegators choose their validators? They'll look at things like the track record. This this slide is sort of like a recap of my panel from the panel from yesterday, but you know, they'll look at the track record, the security setup. Uh, the validators can basically put a self-declared minimum bond. So the validator will know who its validator operator is, and it can say like, oh, the operator can say, oh, I promise to put at least these many coins uh, at stake, and if I go like below this, then like it'll give you a warning and it'll unbond you so that way like I have skin in the game as well. Um, and then you'd look at the commission rate, which is what I was just talking about. Um, so classical redelegation, right? So this is the so this is what happens in the current what would happen in the current like Casper model if you try to redelegate. So what I mean by this is you're a delegator and you're currently delegated to a validator A, and then you say, oh wait, I actually validator B like oh their security setup is actually pretty good. I I want to go with them instead. But what happens is you would be unbonding and you'd be stuck in this unbonding period for weeks to months. And you would, this entire period, you'd be earning no rewards. And then finally, after you finish this unbonding period, you'll get your money back, and now you can redelegate to the validator you want. But the problem is, this is super sticky. Like, who's gonna wanna go through weeks to months of no rewards just in order to change validators? And this will make your cur the current delegations super sticky. So what we've done is, if you build delegation as a first class part of the protocol, you can do what we call instant redelegation. So what I'll do is, I want to change my coins from validator A to B. I can sort of just, you know, instantly move them from one to the other. And you know, how do we maintain this safety? Is you know, when you're delegated to validator A, you move your coins out, and you send them to validator B. And what happens is, you start a pseudo unbonding period for validator A. So your coins are actually delegated to B and are actually earning rewards on B, but, you're, but you're, the protocol is actually still keeping track of any evidence that uh, you know, you're unbonding from A. So if validator A does anything malicious, uh, during the time that they were delegated, that you were delegated to them, you will still get slash and B. So you know, here, like evidence comes in during the unbonding period and it will, the protocol will be smart enough to know how to slash you in validator B. And this is really cool because this basically gives us the ability to move, you know, how I see it is that, you know, mining pools in like Bitcoin and stuff, you know, they're not great, 
but they're livable. We can deal with them because of the fact that miners can basically just like jump between mining pools as fast as they want. They can, you know, every block you can just be flip flopping between mining pools and nothing's stopping you from doing this. And, you know, that helps like keep these mining pools in check, sort of. If we didn't have this process in proof of stake, I think proof of stake would honestly become way too centralized to never work. So, without this, this piece of instant redelegation, I think this is like a key piece that's needed in order to decentralize proof of stake. Um, here's another cool thing that you get when you build delegation in protocol. So, remember how I said that, you know, Tendermint and basically any classical BFT protocol doesn't scale to like infinite validators? So what we do in the protocol is we allow this system, we, we basically say the top N validator candidates are basically the validators. So uh, at launch, we're gonna start with 100, but over time, it's actually gonna go up to 300. Um, and we're working on a lot of like cool research from like the Tendermint side of things, so how we can get this even higher. So you know, you can talk to us afterwards about that. But so you know, basically the point is we can't have 10,000 validators because it just wouldn't work. And so we choose the top 100. And so, you know, in this example for the slides, we'll say, let's say we're taking the top four. Uh, and so what will happen is, you know, let's say I'm a delegator, and why would I ever delegate to someone who's not in the current validator set, right? Because I would not be getting any rewards in this case. And so this basically, once again, becomes a super, super sticky situation where the current validator set gets entrenched because new delegators are coming in will only want to delegate to people who are actually in the validator set. And so what we've done is we created a system, well, okay, so this is, by the way, this part, uh, the instant redelegation has been implemented and works. This one is a spec that has not been implemented yet, so just fair warning. Um, but yeah, so what, how this works is you have a, what we split it up into what we call a commitment and a I don't know what the term for this is yet, but I've been calling it a ghost atom. And so what happens is, what, when you, let's say you're coming in and you say, I want, I really like this, I don't know if you can see the text underneath, but it's like uh, validator E and validator D. Um, so yeah, you say, I really like validator E, but you know, they're not in the validator set, I don't wanna delegate to them. So what I can do is I can give them a commitment, but I can give my actual delegation to validator D. So I'll be earning the rewards of validator e, D while I gave my commitment to validator E. And so currently validator D has two committed atoms and one uncommitted atom. And so, you know, let's say someone else comes along and they have two atoms and they also like validator E. So they give validator E two more commitments. So now validator E has three commitments. Validator D still only has two commitments, but it has three ghost atoms. And so what the protocol will say is it's actually not ordering by uh, total delegation, it's actually ordering by uh, commitments. And so the protocol will say, oh, cool, look, validator E has more commitments than validator D, we'll instantly swap them. And so now validator E will come into the validator set and validator D will be moved out of the validator set. Um, and this is really cool because it kind of solves this like mass coordination problem of a lot of people like this one validator candidate who's not in the validator set yet, and we all wanna to delegate to him, but we all like, we don't wanna be the first ones to do it because we don't know how long it'll take everyone else to do it. So this kind of solves that problem with this commitment mechanism. Uh, yeah, so the, so, so the validator candidate here, so validator D, He's signed up as a candidate. He says, I want to be a validator. Oh, sorry, uh, validator E, right? He's saying, like, I want to be a validator, and I'm looking for delegation. And then uh, the protocol will say, oh, look, when you have enough commitments, uh, you're ready. You're, we'll, we'll push you into the validator set. Yeah. Can you swap your... Yes, so the commitments, there's no... Re so because the commitments are not actually, like... You know, you don't need an unbonding period for commitments, right? So yes, you can, there's no reason you can't just like change your commitment from like different unbonded validators or to a different validator, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you're basically currently delegated to validator D and so you're getting the rewards from D, but, uh, Yes, and in certain circumstances, they'll switch, and basically everyone who gave a commitment to E will basically go through this instant redelegation process. Um, yeah. Cool. So, 
Great. Now we talked a little bit about like how the validator set comes into existence, how like you know the validator set is chosen. Uh, we'll go a little bit now talking, uh, shifting gears a little bit and talking about incentives. Um, and we'll talk kind of more specifically, you know, I guess all of this has been, but like we'll talk a lot about like how uh, the Cosmos Hub will be doing its uh, incentives at least. And so we'll start off, incentives basically have two parts, rewards and punishments. And so we'll start off with the rewards. So another like idea that we had was we have this concept of what we call a staking only token. So instead of trying to create a like currency or a token that has like uh, utility outside of staking, our model has been let's create a token whose sole value is as a staking token for this blockchain. And we kind of think of them similar to ASICs. The staking token is an ASIC. The only value of a like SHA-256 ASIC is to mine Bitcoin, or I guess Bitcoin Cash as well, but yeah. Um, so, you know, the, and the value of these ASIC, and the ASICs do have inherent value. And so what we can do with this is like, you know, they're similar to ASICs because it's like, they're, they're a piece of capital you need in order to be a validator. And the real like incentive, like the rewards are really how we see it in what we call the fee tokens. So the fee tokens, uh, we've created a system on the Cosmos Hub where you can basically, um, ex there'll be a white list of many fee tokens, such as, you know, we'll start with like atoms, but like there'll be Bitcoin, Ether, DAI, uh, photons, uh, these are like different tokens that can be whitelisted by governance. And what will happen is each validator can basically like maintain like, you know, an ordering of how valuable each of these tokens are. And it will choose what to put in its block independently based off of its own personal like ranking. Um, and so this is really cool because I think it really helps the developer, uh, the user experience where it's like, you know, I think that this entire model of like, oh, go buy our token in order to use this one app doesn't really make sense. I think it's like people want to use the asset that they already hold, which is usually either like Bitcoin or Ether or some stable coin or something like that. So, um, and the, er the, the reward, the incentive as a validator is in order to, um, what you do is you earn these, uh, fee tokens. So the more transactions that are happening on your blockchain, the more transaction fees that are coming and you're earning these uh, fees as your primary reward. And that's not to say that we don't have block rewards. We do. There is a block reward schedule, but um, we really see it more as uh, a n way to punish non-stakers. So what we actually do is that the percentage of atoms that are staked, the fewer atoms that are staked, the uh, inflation rate actually increases. So that gives like higher incentive. So the fewer people that are staked, we want more atoms staked. So, uh, so there's more value securing the network. So then the inflation rate increases, further punishing the people who are not staked because the inflation only goes to the stakers, obviously. And um, the rewards are split up uh, evenly amongst all staked validators while um, so the block rewards are split evenly amongst stake validators, while the uh, transaction fees, we have something called the proposer reward, which is basically a uh, portion of all the transaction fees in a block. The proposer of that block gets an extra cut. So um, uh, at least a minimum of 95% is split evenly amongst all the validators, while the 5% is there for the propose, uh, up to 5% is there for the proposer in order to incentivize them to not produce empty blocks. So, you know, processing all the transactions and uh, doing all this takes a lot of like, you know, effort on the part of the validator. And, uh, you know, if you do it incorrectly, you might even, that's, that might even be a slashing condition. So, you know, a lazy validator will be like, oh, I'm, if I'm just getting the same amount of transaction fees anyways, why am I even processing any blocks myself? I'll just produce empty blocks. So this is sort of there as an incentive to produce these empty blocks. But on top of this, we, you know, let's hijack this like incentive thing to add some further incentives. We've got incentives on top of our incentives here. Um, so what we do is the proposal reward, like I said, it gets, it, they get a maximum of 5%, but we actually also care about two other things basically will care about the percentage of the stake from the previous pre-commit. So what happens in Tendermint is basically, you know, the, you, you need two thirds uh, or two thirds plus one of the validator signatures uh, on the next, to, to propose a block, you need to 
show a previous block that has two thirds plus one uh, validator signatures. But it'll be really nice if we could actually encourage them to have more signatures than just the two thirds. So we actually give them an incentive to like hold off a second before proposing their block, wait an extra second or two to see if they can collect more signatures. And if they do, the higher percentage of the stake that whose signatures that they have, they'll get more of this 5% reward. Um, the other thing that we do is Tendermint sort of progresses in what we call rounds. So basically what happens is uh, the first proposal will propose a block, and if that doesn't get committed, uh, then it will go to the next round where a, a new proposer will propose a block. Um, and what we do here is we say that the round number that a block's proposal is from, uh, the higher the round, the proposal reward goes down. And this is so it's sort of a slight incentive for, let's say there's a lot of transaction fees in this block, and you're the you would be the proposer at round two, and you see the proposal from round one, and you kind of, you're like, hmm, maybe if I like censor this, uh, maybe like I can get a chance to propose this block that ha just have you know maybe there's an ICO going on in this block and that's why there's a lot of transaction fees. And so the idea is that reducing the uh, proposal reward uh, as the round number goes higher is sort of a, a slight incentive to like deal with this this like this uh, scenario where to disincentivize censorship of blocks produced at a previous round. Cool. Um, and then, you know, this is more of like an implementation thing, but we've spent a lot of time on this and we're kind of proud of it, so I'm just gonna tell about it. Um, you know, one of the main things that, like from the implementation standpoint that we've been super worried about is how do we make this entire process um, computationally efficient? So, you know, imagine that every single block to distribute rewards and fees, we had to iterate over all of the stakers and not the validators. Iterating over the validators is pretty bad. That's like still 100 every block. But the stakers, there could be, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of delegators. And if we had to go over every single one of them, every single block to distribute, that would be crazy. So we, you know, we created a, uh, a, a method for passive accounting. Uh, we have a couple of different specs for this. Um, and, you know, not gonna go into too much detail, uh, but yeah, basically, you know, you get like shares into the common pool and the rewards go into a pool and, you know, fancy passive accounting. Um, one, and one of the cool things, uh, or not cool things, but one of like the caveats I should mention is that any um, block rewards that you earn and start off unbonded. So this is something we've been sort of like debating for a long time, which, which is like, okay, if a, you know, let's say I have 10 uh, atoms, uh, but you know, I'm getting a block reward of one atom. Does that start off in my bond, so now do I have 11, or does that start off liquid in my account? And so we've had a lot of like back and forth on this. Um, some people from uh, Chorus One, uh, they were kind of really helping us out on this process, and they basically suggested, like, you know, we we ended up deciding to start them off unbonded because um, we we wanted the ability for validators to charge commission rates on the uh, block rewards, and um, for reasons I don't really want to go into right now, but it becomes very uh, incompatible to do these to charge commission on block rewards, but to have them start off bonded in a computationally efficient way, which is why we decided not to do that. Um, all right, punishments. So, you know, there's two sort of like punishments we really need to deal with. There's liveness bugs and uh, safety bugs. So liveness bugs is basically, you know, we want validators to like um, be online and signing blocks because, you know, you, you, can't, you can't just be a validator and just go offline and let everyone else do all the work because if everyone does that, then like, you know, we won't be making any blocks. So what we've done is uh, we created um, a way to do liveness slashing. So basically the Cosmos Proof of Stake uh, protocol uh, module will handle this where, you know, for this diagram, a green block means you signed on it, a red block means you did not sign on it. And so what will happen here is there's a liveness window. So in this case, the liveness window will be five blocks for this example. And you have to sign on at least 50% of the blocks in that five minute window. Um, and so, you know, we're going through and ever, so here's the liveness window. Okay, you're still signed on 50%. Now another block comes in. You didn't sign on the next one, but look, you're still in 50% in the liveness window. And you know, it just keeps going until, uh-oh, you have not signed on 50% of the blocks in the window. By the way, in the real in the real protocol, like this window is not five blocks; it's more in the scale of like one. It's on the scale; it uses time rather than blocks, and also it's based off of like it'll be like hours or days, like 48 hours or so. 
Um, and so, you know, here you'll get a Leibniz slash. And what this means is you'll get a slight slash. So we're not sure what the percentage is exactly yet, but it will probably be pretty slight, like l around 1%. Um, and you'll get put in a jail period for two days, which basically means you're like kind of like kicked out of the validator set, you're in jail, but um, as soon as you're done with your jail period, you can rejoin the validator set and all the delegators who are delegated to you, they will like c stay with you. Like they won't like, um, yeah, so this two days is sort of like, you know, it's an additional punishment that doesn't, it's like, instead of slashing you more, we like, oh, this is a nice little punishment. You're kind of kicked out for two days in timeout. Um, and then, you know, after two days, you can choose to rebond. Um, and the nice thing is the jail period does get credited to the unbonding period. So basically, if you're put in jail and your delegators decide, oh, I don't like you anymore, I want to, like, redelegate because you were, like, obviously you couldn't prove your liveness, uh, you know how they're put into that unbonding period? The jail period will be credited towards it. So instead of, like, three weeks, now you'll have an unbonding period of, like, two weeks and five days. So, yeah, just fun implementation stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so you're right. Um, so, yeah, so you're saying that if that guy comes back, now those 100, the people who are, like, now in that, who were committed to that 100 first, now they'll, like, yeah. So, um, like I said, we haven't implemented the commitments yet. So, you know, these are some of the, like, ca these are sort of things that we kind of just have to decide. Uh, but, like, you know, I don't see any implementation issues with this. It's more of just, like, what, what are the trade-offs of doing this? And... To me, I think the easiest implementation would be to auto redelegate them, uh, and then the, if they want to, after that guy's kicked out of the validator set again, they can go ahead and uh, go back to their commitment and stuff. So, uh, to be determined. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, so Byzantine slashing is um, unlike. So uh, the thing is, the state machine actually does keep track of this whole liveness slashing stuff. While uh, the nice thing about tenement consensus is it handles all the slashing conditions for you. You don't have to worry about it. It just sends you a message, the state machine saying, hey, here's the validators who, who did this, this type of Byzantine fault. And so, uh, you know, it'll tra track stuff like double signing, uh, breaking a tenement locking condition, signing a block while you're in the unbonding period. Um, you know, these are, there's some cool stuff that we actually realize that if you think about tenement consensus as just a consensus protocol, Thing, slashing conditions that don't really exist, but then when you start to think of it, oh, how do you actually build an actual implementation, you start to realize that, oh, there are certain slashing conditions that you need to implement for uh, a real live system. And one of these is this, like, signing a block while you're in the unbonding period. We actually realize that if you do this, um, you can, there's a, there's a bit of an attack where you can actually trick a light client into following a fork, and so we need to make this a slashing condition. Um, and yeah, like I said, there can be the, there can be a delay between the infraction and the evidence uh, time, and so uh, what we do is at the time of the first evidence, the validator is slashed and what we call killed. Uh, basically, this means that the validator set is kicked out of the validator set. They're not allowed to join again until after the you know they could finish the unbonding period, take whatever coins they have left, and re start a new validator. But like you know th they're gonna have to like re-earn all of those delegators. The delegators won't come along with them. Um, and one of the nice things that we did was um, only the worst infraction is tracked. So what this means is, let's say you get like one evidence A comes in, and this is like worth this is an infraction that's supposed to be a 30% slash. So you'll get a slash of 30%, and then you'll start the unbonding period. Um, and then evidence B comes in and say, oh wait, here's an even worse evidence. This one's actually worth 40%. So your total slash will switch to 40%. And then, you know, another evidence comes in and says, oh, this is a slash that's, like, worth 35%. But it's like, no, it, the, the state machine will reject this slash and say, oh, you know, we already have a worse slash for this guy. Like, he's already committed a worse crime. We don't need to know about his lesser crimes. Um, this is useful for two reasons. Uh, 
primarily um, one, it's that let's say your key was compromised uh, as a validator. You don't want you, you know you don't you want to get the worst possible slash you got. Like you know, someone took your key and it's causing like Byzantine faults. You'd like them to not be able to slash you all the way to zero. You'd like them to only slash you like a certain amount. Uh, so this kind of prevents that. It caps the amount that you'll be slashed. And the other thing is it actually prevents a DOS attack where uh, the state machine, it prioritizes uh, evidence, right? Because that it should be. But what would happen is if you're, you've already been slashed 100%, um, now you might as well just keep causing like Byzantine faults, like distinct Byzantine faults, and you could DOS the chain with evidence. And so this is not a good thing. So this is why the state machine will reject any uh, evidence that's already sort of been seen. Or, or not, any, not repetitive, it's not evidence that's already been seen, it's but like evidence from the same validator, but like different valid evidence. Um, okay, and then, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but, uh, oh, I think I have time. Um, so this is what I call incentivizing decentralization. This is sort of like a fun idea that me and a couple, uh, another person, Rigel, uh, came up with a couple of months ago at ETH Waterloo. Uh, we're not actually implementing this, but I think it's a fun little idea to chew on. Um, what we do here is, you know, what we were kind of worried about is what happens if a few validators become so popular that they get almost all of the delegation, right? Like, you know, uh, these guys, like, you know, let's say Coinbase created a validator tomorrow, right? And like, you know, everyone's like, oh, we trust Coinbase so much. Like, why, would, why wouldn't we delegate to them? And so um, what we did was we said, how do we prevent, uh, like, how do we make sure the delegation is somewhat decentralized? We can't, what we can't do is say that you have to, like, each validator is capped to a certain amount, because then what I do is I just go ahead and split up my, like, stake across multiple validators and get more delegation, right? That's not civil resistant. Um, so what we did was we said, okay, look, there's a distribution of, so if you ignore the top part of the slide, you only look at the bottom part. You look at a validator's self bonds. So you say, oh, look, validator A has two, the other two have three. So, you know, it'd be nice if we could get delegation that somewhat mimics that same uh, ratios. And so how we do this is we say, okay, each validator, so now we're taking the delegation, has some ratio of their delegation to their self bond. So for you know, validator A, it's three to two. Uh, for B, it's four to three, and for C, it's twelve to three. And, you know, let's just normalize this to fraction uh, to decimals. Uh, and so it's like 1.5, 1.33, and four. And what we can do is we can take these what we call leverage ratios, and we can put them on this like graph. And you basically say the average of the leverage ratios up till that point. Uh, if you're below the average, you get 100% of the rewards that you're supposed to get. And if you're above that point, your rewards start to slightly go down. I'm we're not sure how much this would be, but like, you know, it wouldn't be like crazy. You won't go to zero, but it'd be like a slight amount, just enough to maybe like incentivize your delegators to say, oh, wait, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at an over leveraged validator. There's this other validator that's still pretty good, and, you know, he's under leveraged right now. I might as well redelegate to him so that way, um, you know, I can get slightly more rewards. And so this is kind of cool because it's like creating incentives to, re to decentralize rather than like forcing it down people's throat where it's like, you know, maybe like a validator, none of the ones who are under leveraged are that great. We're not forcing you to delegate to them. We're just adding some incentives to do so. Um, yeah, and then, so I guess I'll just talk a little bit about like, you know, further work and specifically like, you know, what you guys can do to help us. Um, you know, one is help us attack and improve our economic and theoretical models. You know, if you have any bugs, if you have seen any issues with what, we're, what I've said so far, or, you know, you have cool ideas for how to improve proof of stake, uh, please talk to us and let us know. Uh, yeah. Um, help us properly parameterize constants. You might have noticed, like, throughout this thing, I've been seeing, like, a lot of constants, right? Uh, 0 0.5, you saw in, like, that, especially that proposer uh, thing, there's, like, a 0 0.9 in there. Or, you know, how long should the unbonding, like, the liveness window be? How long should the unbonding period be? Uh, you know, there's all sorts of, like, constants, which, quite honestly, like, we just don't have enough data. Like, there's been no existing legitimate, like, uh, proof of stake blockchains who have been running for a long enough time to really collect data for how this stuff works. And so 
a lot of the concerts that we chose are honestly just from gut feelings and like we don't know where these concerts came from. In fact, the one that point nine that I was like put in that equation, I was tempted to just make it like E over pi just to show like the utter silliness of these constants that we have right now. And so, you know, if there's any economists in the room who like have an idea of like, you know, here's how we can actually model these constants and like try to figure out what these constants should actually be, that would be very useful and helpful. Um, next, we have this uh, what we call help us simulate real world attacks and game of stakes. So we're running this uh, competition called Game of Stakes starting mid October, uh, where basically the Interchain Foundation is basically will give a monetary reward of atoms or gift of atoms. I don't know what the terminology is we're using for legal reasons is. But um, uh, so the monetary gift of atoms to uh, basically we'll have a test net in which there'll be many validators who will sort of be competing with each other. And we want to like test like censorship attacks and like validators attacking each other, security setups and stuff. So you're interested more in like, you know, let's like, you know, theory is fun, but let's actually like go out and attack each other, start collusion attacks. So uh, participate in this game of stakes. Uh, you could probably afterwards talk to us about it and if you're interested in participating. So that'll be starting mid-October. Um, help us test and contribute to the open source code base. So uh, like I said, most of the stuff that I've been talking about, some of the features haven't been implemented. Like I said, validation commitments, but a lot of the stuff, instant redelegation, et cetera. So, this is all, all of this like theory has been implemented in a module using the Cosmos SDK, which I gave a workshop on yesterday. But um, yeah, so if you wanna like come test out, you know, check out the code, read through it, help us audit it, debug it, just run it. Um, we'd love open, we've had a lot of open source contribution already and we'd love more. So please help us out with that. Um, and then I guess help us come up with a name for Cosmos Proof of Stake, I don't know. Christine says bonded proof of stake. I'm like iffy on that. Uh, Ethan Buckman, who's a CTO, has suggested BDSM proof of stake. It stands for bonding, delegation, slashing, Merkle proof of stake. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's gonna fly. Uh, so I don't know. I'm looking for a cool name. I thought liquid proof of stake kind of sounds cool, but you know, Tezos already has that. So yeah. Cosmos, Cosmos, what? what? Oh, a cost post. Okay, I like that. All right. Yeah. Anyways, so that's all I had for you guys. Um, I have like. Oh yeah. So um, you know, you can go to cosmos.network, and so there uh, you can find uh, there'll be a link to a newsletter. There'll be links to the riot, the validators riot channel, which uh, so that will be kind of where the coordination for game of stakes is happening. Um, what? Yeah, the public. Uh, Okay, yeah. Honestly, all the people in this front row are like, you know, you can come talk to us afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So the state, yeah, so the, the, the Tendermint core will keep track of different types of evidence. So, you know, like I mentioned the three for now. Uh, and so the state machine can basically say, oh, this type of evidence is worth this much of a slash. This type will be worth this much of a slash. And so this is actually a new feature that we uh, realized that needed to be implemented. It's called check evidence. So um, basically, Tendermint Core, before proposing a block, it will ask the state machine saying like, hey, is the evidence in this block that I'm about to pro propose, is it uh, good enough? I is it, or has it already been seen? And if the state machine says it already has, uh, that's an invalid block to propose. Um, so that actually has more to do with the Tendermint side of things, but yes. So the idea behind Tendermint BFT is that there's, you don't need confirmation, you need one confirmation essentially. So once a block has been finalized, it is like finalized. You don't need to like wait. Uh, and this is like, you know, a lot of use cases for this. The other main thing, like you know, Cosmos, we've been or Tendermint, we've been working on like two things: Tendermint and Cosmos. Tendermint has been a lot of this like uh, Tendermint uh, BFT, like proof of stake kind of thing. Cosmos is this whole like interoperability stuff, and so this BFT consensus, one block finality, helps a lot there. And that's kind of like the linkage between the two projects. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Um,
uh, so they, they'll get slashed. So the, the protocol keeps track of like, okay, look, I've instantly redelegated from validator A to B, but it keeps track which of the, how many shares of B I have, or, or the coins in B I have, and then if validator A gets slashed, it'll, it'll keep track of that, oh, I, I'm still in that pseudo unbonding period for validator A, and it will go ahead and slash my coins in B. Yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, I think the, well, I don't know. I th so I'm a huge fan of like what I call monetary like innovation where I think that like, um, I think that this whole utility token stuff is a little bit silly, but I think like innovation for like monetary policy is really cool. And personally, what I want to see with uh, so Ether doesn't have an inflation schedule. I think that uh, you know they change it by like GitHub votes like on a weekly basis or something. I don't know. Um, and the Bitcoin I think has a perverse monetary incentives where it's like you know just hyper deflationary. So for me, I personally see photons as uh, what we're trying to do is constant uh, inflate. Uh, rate of inflation, so 500 photons per hour till the end of time. So it's still deflationary, but it's like less hyper deflationary as Bitcoin. So, you know, I think it's a cool monetary experiment. That's what I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could probably do something like this using, uh, yeah, maybe, Dave, do you want to answer this? The other thing is that the BLS signatures will also help a lot from the tendermint side of things. So this is one of the things that we were talking about, one of our main like things of how to increase the number of validators that tendermint can support is by using BLS uh, aggregation at the gossip layer. So let's say I'm a full node, I've received the uh, signatures from two validators, I can locally aggregate the signatures and send over one signature. And so this will hopefully heavily reduce the network load. Uh, and so that will, hopefully allow us to scale to more validators. Yeah. Yes. Which one, which part? Oh, the minting of new tokens. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, so how I like to think of staking tokens, I, see, if I could, what I would like to do is do something called demurrage which is like, I would actually prefer to, all the tokens that are not staked, I'd actually prefer to decay them rather than inflate the uh, staking token supply. Because like I said, my goal with the inflation is really just to punish non-stakers. But the problem is implementing demurrage is very computationally like intensive, right? I'd have to iterate over all the non-staked -co non coins and like decay them somehow. Especially when you get IBC involved, where it's like, oh, now there might be some atoms that are on a different chain. That would be like, no, dealing with this is insane. So that's kind of why inflation is the way to get around this. And then, you know, the, the part of what makes it a little bit different than a security is that the the reason I really like like to sh compare it to ASICs is that just the holding of an ASIC isn't valuable in its of itself, right? You actually have to mine with the ASICs. The same thing with the staking token. The holding of a staking token isn't in and of itself valuable. You actually have to put in the effort of validation of validating with it, and it's not. It's just a piece of like it. it, it it's a, it's a decaying piece of capital if you're not putting it to work. Yeah. To you to build an app on the Cosmos network. Oh, um, I don't know about the first, but there's a bunch like uh, in progress already. Um, I think I think the one that like I know is like really far ahead is a project called Lino Network. Uh, they like reached out to us like age like last January or something, and like awesome project. They 
They so they were building on. Um, have you heard of DLive? It's like this like decentralized YouTube kind of thing. And so they actually just are uh, building their project on um, uh, Lino, and Lino is using the Cosmos SDK and stuff. So I think that if I had to like bet, I'd say they'd probably be the first consumer uh, DAP that will end up launching. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Great. Thank you all. Um, to use the SDK or which part of Cosmos, I guess? Uh, um, no, so I think that Bitcoin, you know, okay, so I would say Bitcoin serves its purpose as like, you know, how I see it happen, working out is Bitcoin will hopefully just like turn into this proof of work mint where coins are minted and then immediately flow out into other blockchains. Um, when it comes to smart contracting platforms, so Cos I, mean, I guess this is going a little bit into Cosmos rather than proof of stake, but like, you know, we're kind of building this concept of like application specific blockchains, chains that are like have core logic embedded into them and they have a singular purpose, like a DEX chain or a prediction markets chain or something like that. And that's not to say that smart contracts aren't useful. I just think that they're useful for exactly what they sound like as smart contracts. Like, you know, if I want to do a contract between me and you, I should use a smart contract. If I want to do a one-time thing like an ICO contract or something, I should use a smart contract. But if you're building like production applications, I don't think smart contracts are a great platform to do that on. Yeah. Uh, I have like another whole 30 minute presentation to you guys. Why don't we give that one as well? Uh, Okay, I mean, yeah, so I mean, you know, how it works. So, so are you talking specifically how do you do the like clients with Bitcoin? Okay, so yeah, so Bitcoin is hard because of the, you know, just the stateless nature of Bitcoin. Um, what? Yeah, so, you know, we, we are doing some research on this. Um, one of the things that we're like looking into is like how we can maybe use like some sort of MPC computation to do this uh, in order, like, because the other problem is not only is it like, the other problem is that Bitcoin multi-sigs are also themselves heavily limited in the number of signers. And until they implement something like Schnorr signatures, it'll be hard to get like enough uh, coins onto there. Um, another one that I'm really excited about is um, Paul Storsk. He, probably huge proof of stake skeptic, so I'd love to show him the slides at some point. But um, you know, he, he, he's been working on a project for a long time called Drive Chains. And Drive Chains. And so Drive Chains are, uh, sort of what IBC, our IBC is for like proof of stake blockchains, drive chains are that for uh, proof of work blockchains. And so they're basically a way for the uh, validator set, uh, oh, so the, sort of the miners of Bitcoin in order to be able to like sort of maintain a common wallet and like do this sort of IBC stuff. So really cool research coming out from him. And, you know, I, I always, he's been working on this project for years. And I always thought it's like, oh, he's just like a side project for him. And like, I haven't really heard about it for like months and like for months. And then like last week, he's like, oh, we got, here's my, my finished implementation and they have a test net running and everything. So I, I, I'm pretty excited for that. But I was, yeah. Problem is, I don't know if it'll ever get implemented in Bitcoin, but you know, it, there's a Bitcoin cash hackathon going on outside. So if anyone wants to try hacking on that there. Yeah. Um, cool. Awesome. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you.